here. Today we have a big shoe, and we have our guest Kit O'Toole, a famous author of all things Beetle and many other things. And we have Warren Brown, my co-host and friend, and his artwork speaks for itself in pages like the Beatles' Kingdom. So welcome, you two. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I, I really I think this is going to be a great discussion tonight. Well, because you're here, I agree with you. Warren, do you have you spoken and met Kid before? Uh, no, this is the first time I ever spoke to her, and it, it's very nice. Uh, she's part of my Beatles group uh, on Facebook called The Beatles Kingdom, and she's also part of your Tomorrow Never Knows, Bob. Well, bless her for that. We need our members. You mentioned something. You got a you got a couple of early presents this holiday season. You got them way back in September here. What did you get in the mail, Warren? I got two awesome books by an awesome author, and uh, they are who we are talking to uh, today, Kit O'Toole. And the books are lovely, and I thank you very much for them, Kit. Oh, you're most welcome. I I hope you enjoy them. Oh, I'm going now, to love what, them. I'm jealous. What been. books would these be? Uh, the books are Songs We Were Singing and uh, Michael Jackson's uh, FAQ. That's right. All right. They sound like two hot items. I know I've read those, and they've more than kept my interest. I highly recommend them. And later, at the end of our program, Kit will tell us where you can order those if you want to add them to your library. Absolutely. So, all right. So, awesome Kit, uh, we just mentioned the books and things, but you also do podcasts. Tell us yes. about your. This makes me nervous on my podcast. Oh, you no. Have a podcast. <laughs> no, you know I uh -oh. I haven't been in Tell it. Tell us that about long. yours. Oh, it's great. I'm yeah, kidding, oh. but it's really great. Oh, they, well, and and really, I I haven't been in it for very long, but it's it's been a blast. It's called Talk More Talk, a solo vi uh, Beatles video cast, and it actually so it's it's a podcast, uh, but uh, primarily a video cast. We uh, twice a month. Uh, we broadcast, I, I co-host it with some wonderful people, uh, which I'm sure you all know, uh, Ken Michaels, Tom Hanyati, Ken Womack, uh, and we have a, a new uh, member of the group that uh, comes in when uh, one of us can't make it, which, uh, you know, we, we have really busy schedules at times, so um, you know him on YouTube as Mean Mr. Mayo. And uh, he's been a really fun addition. And, uh, yeah, we talk about all things solo. You know, we decided that there there weren't quite as many podcasts devoted just to the solo, solo catalog. So we decided to add another twist to it and, and do it as a video. So we do it on Facebook Live first, and then the show is available on YouTube. You can watch it anytime you want, and then it's available as just a podcast if you prefer listening to it. Um, you know, it's on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, basically anywhere uh, that uh, where you get your podcasts. And uh, and we also love, and, and Bob, you know this because you've, you've tuned into the show many times we love audience participation you know we really want this to be a a discussion you know with not just amongst ourselves but with listeners too and so that's been a really fun part of the show and usually when i as soon as i spot it i throw it up on meeting the beatles too um, yes, but what's you the do. main what's the main facebook page for that one does that one have its own page because i usually yes, i know it i get does. it for you it comes yep, up in it, my feed Yep, it is. Uh, it's Talk More Talk. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, well, it's um, Facebook.com slash uh, Talk More Talk. I think it's, uh, I will actually, I'm, I'm calling this up on my computer now to, to double check that that's the exact address. But that's actually the best place to find us. And if you subscribe, uh, you'll, you'll uh, you know, just hit the like button. Uh, you'll get notified of any new episodes that we have. Okay, it's Talk More Talk video cast. So it's Facebook.com slash Talk More Talk video cast. And so, you, you know, you'll find us. And it's good awesome. stuff and top notch, and, and I recommend it. You know, when I was a kid and I was collecting the Beatles records, 
um, I remember the first few that I got, and the one I wanted was Beetle 6. But oh. my mom brought my sister along, and she nixed that. She let her pick them because she was like eight years older than me. That's like a needle now at this age. She's eight years older than me. So, <laughs> so she picked out ones that I didn't want as much, but I wanted them. But one that she picked out was like Hey Jude, and the other one was Sergeant Pepper. But um, oh. as you go through these albums, and and I've uh, I've you know read your book, and some of the songs in there come from the EPs I learned, and the LPs are different in both countries. So in England they had a different label um, that was related to the American label, I guess. But they put out some different albums. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the distribution process and how these albums came to be a little bit different, please? Sure, and uh, and this is, by the way, you you guys are going to hear me say this a lot of times <laughs> through this this discussion. What's that the behave? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Quiet um, down, you guys. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Write it down. Uh, that <laughs> the U.S. versus U.K. releases, it's all about money. <laughs> and uh, you're going to hear me talking about money quite a bit because uh, that's what this was. So the their label in England was EMI, was the parent label, and Parlophone. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Parlophone was the uh, was sort of the subsidiary of EMI. So um, you know they were releasing the albums first. Well. It's amazing to think that when Please Please Me came out, the American market wasn't interested, you know, and uh, Capital was EMI's counterpart in, in the U.S., and they just were not convinced that they were going to be, you know, huge, and so they passed on it, <laughs> if you can believe it. So... Uh, so they, what happened was they then shopped the album to a bunch of smaller labels, one of them uh, being VJ, uh, which is a label that uh, it's no, no longer exists, but it was right here in Chicago, actually, where, where I'm from. And, uh, and so they ended up releasing this album called Introducing the Beatles, which was basically Please Please Me. Um, well, of course, the Beatles explode. You know, and so Capital says, "Uh oh, um, and we screwed up." So, um, you know, we're interested, and so that's how they they got to you know Capital got to distribute the albums um, in America. But as we're going to talk about uh, the Capital albums um, up through Revolver were quite different than the British versions. Yes, they no, were. it's kind of. Some, something that you mentioned really particularly jumped out at me, and that is, you know, at first they passed on those albums. It seems kind of funny when you think in retrospect, right, you know, that someone could pass on the Beatles. Um, so people didn't, in the industry, they really didn't sense the uh, the tremors that were coming behind this, you know, did they? I mean, we're all human. Who could have known in a sense? But well, uh, and you, what comes to your mind with that? Well, I'll tell you that, you know, as I said, hard for us to believe now, right? But back in, you know, the early 60s, um, you know, British acts were not really breaking through to America. I mean, it was pretty rare. And so I think probably the, the capital execs thought, eh, you know, they're too British. Um, you know, American audiences probably can't connect to them, so – you know, no thanks. So, I mean, the Beatles were really one of the, the earliest British acts to actually break through in America. I mean, that's why when they, uh, you know, first came here in 64, it was a very carefully planned uh, marketing strategy. And, of course, getting on Ed Sullivan was was crucial to them breaking through. So, you know, that's the thing. It, it was a different market uh, back then that, that you know, and even today, I think, um, there are artists that are huge in Britain, and they just have not, you know, crossed over to America. Um, but it was even more that way back in, you know, 63. It, it was just sort of unheard of. So I think that's probably why the label initially passed on them. Every show I try to break in a new vocabulary word in, t in case I ever take the SATs again. So tonight I'm using erudite. Because I knew you were coming on and, and you're so erudite. I did more research you. than usual. You're welcome. Oh. 
But it's um, I, I looked up that with the Beatles actually came up out on November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, and please please me had come out in March sixty three. But it struck me, you know, the day that Kennedy was shot, that was the day um, in the research I saw that uh, with the Beatles was released. Um, yeah. Those two yeah. events seem so entwined in your mind. How do those two come together? Well, you know, that that has actually been a subject of, of debate for a long time, that, you know, was there a connection? And, um, you know, I, I think it was sort of a case of, of the Beatles just, you know, obviously a lot of it was hard work, but a lot of it, too, was, was just luck. I mean, they came in at a time, not, not just really, I mean, yes, I mean, of course, the country had gone through the JFK assassination, but if you also look at the charts, from that period, it, it with maybe the exception of the Beach Boys, you know, um, it wasn't a great period in music. You know, there there wasn't. You know, it was very safe. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, you had uh, Frankie Avalon and and that kind of stuff. Uh, you had the Singing Nun. You had you know things like that. And I think you know people were ready for a new kind of sound. And and the Beatles were it. And, you know, if you listen to them, I, I remember years ago at a Beatle Fest watching uh, one of the um, oh, uh, uh, New Music Express Reader's Poll um, co- uh, concerts, and the Beatles, I mean, they won many years in a row. And they were playing alongside a bunch of other popular bands of the time, and the Beatles just always stood out. You know, they were they were just ahead of everybody um, in, in one way or the other. They were different. And so I think that was a big part of it, that they just brought this freshness to their music. And, and as I said, it was during a, a period of, you know, kind of doldrums in, uh, in the pop charts. I have to throw the engine into reverse for a second. This, this singing nun, was that Sally Field? She used to grab her head in a breeze with <laughs> <laughs> Who is this singing? I feel very ignorant. Who is this sing, singing nun? You know what? Uh, actually, Sally Sally Field was <laughs> Sally Field was she was the fifth Beatle? She was the flying nun. <laughs> oh, all right. She was a flying nun. Right. The singing nun was uh, she had it was you know it was uh, and and don't ask me why this took off like it did, but there was it was a song I think it was called Dominique. And I have no idea, uh, you know, if, if you know somebody out there listening, if they can explain to me why this song was such a big hit back in the day, I'd love to hear it because it was just. So she was sitting around the convent with a guitar, and the next <laughs> thing she knows, there was plate spinners, and she was out singing Dominique. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was just, but yeah, and then there was, uh, oh, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> And I'm blanking out on his name right now, but there was another like one hit wonder that was big during the same area, and the song was called Sukiyaki, which you, you may have heard. I'm not sure, but oh, I can't think of his name. And um, you know, uh, believe a Japanese artist. So I mean, there were a lot of novelty songs like that. And again, it wasn't all bad. I mean, you had Frankie Valley. I mean, you know, Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. They were doing some interesting stuff, but but. Then you had the singing nun. <laughs> well, if you're a nun looking for a niche and a little cabaret act, you know, now is the time to come up. So it was That's good. right. <laughs> exactly. But, but as, far, as far as those lads from Liverpool go, I know their manager, Brian Epstein, and their, you know, record producer, George Martin, all the fans know all this stuff. I'm always afraid to make a, make a mistake on these shows because everybody's like the king of minutia or the queen of minutia. Oh, no. I'm always afraid to misspeak. I'm going to get emails and stuff. But as 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 the releases were coming out, it seems that those two guys, I mean, I can kind of understand why, but they liked the way the English releases were coming out with the songs that were on it, the number of songs, the way they were done, as opposed to the American albums. Is that is there some truth in that? And why, why did they prefer the English releases to the American releases? Well, Ed, that is 100% true, Bob. Bob. It was absolutely they preferred, you know, the, the English version, the U.K. version is what they intended, you know. And I think it was because, you know, particularly George Martin and the Beatles, I mean, they were very involved with the track listing. And, and for some reason, 
And this is something I've been, because it, it gets very confusing with business contracts and so forth. I guess because Capital essentially bought the rights to distribute the music in America. I'm not 100% sure of that. But they had amazing freedom to just reconstruct the albums. I mean, with no input uh, from George Martin or Brian Epstein. That They, you know, was without their consent, without their knowledge. And, you know, they were, and here we go, as I mentioned top of the show, I'm going to be talking about money. Um, <laughs> that Money uh, don't get everything, it's true. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That'll that'll be the theme song of this episode because <laughs> that's Warren what. Warren can weave in, it in later. Yep, there you go. And uh, yeah, that they you know Capital wanted to crank out as many albums as they could, um, you know, and get that product out there. And so that's when they started, you know, cutting up the the, the tracks on the album, putting some on some albums, some on you know others, and and I mean, you know, I I guess Brian Epstein and George Martin were not happy to say the least, but you know they felt this was better for the American market, and as I said, they just wanted more product out there. Now in those days, like uh, when when I was a teenager, I used to take the train into Manhattan to look like in the you know vintage record stores and stuff. Yeah. Like in Greenwich Village, they'd have these special shops like Bleaker Bob's. Mm-hmm. And up on the wall, I'd look at the picture single CDs. In those days, I think you could get them for like five bucks. Oh, I'm and sure. And they also had now me being an American lad, I'd look up and look at the wall where they had all these Beatles singles up there, and some of them didn't only have two songs, like one on each side of a small record. You know, now I'm just getting used to CDs, and now, like, music pretty much comes over. You clap your hands, and a computer has it playing in the air magically by itself. I'm not used to this. But in those days, we actually had physical things you'd have to put on something called the turntable kits. And then you'd wind it up like a butter churner and pump it with your feet, and it'd spin. And then you could put a needle on it, and you'd hear the magical songs from England. But they call those EPs. So as I'm sitting there churning my butter and listening to my music, what was an EP? Well, an EP, and, and EPs are, are still around, although, as you pointed out, in, in different forms. You know, now computers enter into it. But, but it means, of course, extended play. You know, that's what it stands for. And it's really, it's, it's a recording that contains more tracks than a single. I mean, as you mentioned, you know, typical single, you have your A side and B side. Well, with an EP, you might have three or, or usually like three to six tracks, somewhere around there. Not enough for an album, you know, a full album, but more than a typical single. And these were particularly big in the UK in, in the 60s, much more than here. Um, and so uh, and the other thing, you know, I, I, when I was kind of studying up for this show tonight, um, I also learned that, you know, in Britain, it was kind of frowned upon uh, to have too many singles, you know, that were really then appear on the album. In, in other words, you know, it would be making the record buying public buy things twice. And, you know, and so they were, the Beatles were really conscious about wanting to create value, you know, which I think is pretty admirable. I, I don't think many artists feel that way today, but, <laughs> but they, they wanted to give people their money's worth. So they didn't want to have to, you know, make you keep buying things over and over again. So they would release an EP with, you know, four songs on it. Um, and those songs then did not necessarily appear on their you know, the album that came out after that. So uh, Capital loved to then take those, you know, songs from the EPs and put them on different albums, you know, they would, because for some reason EPs just did not take off as much here um, as, as they did in the UK. And I honestly don't have an answer, you know, as to why. Well, that was a pretty, that was a pretty good answer overall about them. Um, I guess they seem to be a European phenomenon just from what I, you know, from going into the store. My thing was I'd never seen this before. I'd seen my dad and mom and grandfather save some 78s. Try and explain that to the kids today. They weighed like as much as like a lead donut. And you to try and, it was like an inch thick. And like, you know, you could, if you had a fight with your brother or sister, you could crack them over the head with it. And your parents would take everybody to the emergency room and scold you. 
but, uh, but you know, they <laughs> they didn't really have the EPs in in America at all. I hadn't seen them at all. You know? Yeah, Just I mean, I and it, yeah, and and I yeah, exactly. You could get them in yeah, as imports if if you were lucky. And uh, and it's really funny because I I you know talking about it just recently i saw that miley cyrus who i'm i'm not a fan of but i just saw that she was coming out and i was really surprised they said she's coming out with an ep and i was really surprised i mean i just thought wow that's a term i haven't heard here in a while and um you know but of course today it's so different with you know downloading songs and that sort of thing. So you know an EP today is very different than an EP from back then. But uh, but yeah, it, it was really interesting how uh, that just you know that format just did not really take if off you, here. You're probably using Miley me. Cyrus. Who is this Miley Cyrus? No, <laughs> no but I know who she's like. When she when she releases it though, it's going to be an electronic thing. It's not going to be like a throwback. They're not going to make like a vinyl disc. Not that I'm aware of, but I'm I'm not sure. But it does seem like that you know thus far it's going to be just a you know a download. But uh, but I don't know you know because of course vinyl is coming back a bit. You know it's having a kind of Miley a, Cyrus kind of sounds like a Norwegian weapon. You know we were at war with the Norwegians and they brought out the Miley Cyrus, so we ran for <laughs> <laughs> that. That aside. <laughs> Uh, some of the records I like the most are Beatles 6 and Something New, and some people disdain my answer because these weren't pure albums like that would have come from England that uh, Brian Epstein and George Martin would have favored. But uh, I like those albums, Beatles 6 and Something New. They were records that basically came from these EPs and singles, and they were put together and such? You know, it's it's funny. I again in in researching because I haven't listened uh, to the to those American versions in quite a while. So I was you know going back to refresh my memory of of what was on you know which because I mean I did start out you know I became a fan in probably eighty five or something. So I did start out on the American albums because of course that's all you could get um, back then. But uh, you know so it's been a while since I've I've listened to these. But you know as I went through the tracks, it's it's a combination. Um, in the case of, um, let's see here, I'm just scrolling through my notes here. Okay, here, something new. So, you know, I looked at that, and it was sort of a combination of songs from the UK version of A Hard Day's Night, and then um, two cuts from the Long Tall Sally EP that, that came out only in England, you know, didn't, uh, didn't come out here, so capital. And, you know, feel free uh, in post-production to put, like, a cash register um, uh, sound effect right here. Um, <laughs> they, they're they like, you know, okay, EPs are, you know, don't sell in the U.S., so we'll just slap them on these compilations, you know. And so that's what they did with Slow Down and Matchbox on something new. So it wasn't overwhelmingly EP tracks. And, and same thing with Beatles 6. I was looking at that, too. And, uh, yeah, it isn't overwhelmingly. Um, it's, it's a combination of, of Beatles for sale, uh, some singles, um, and a couple of cuts from Help. I mean, it, it's just astounding to me how they played around with, you know, and took songs from different albums and, and made these new, new albums. It's, it's just, you know, it's fascinating. Well, I thought Beatles 6 was kind of cohesive. Like, if you listen to it, the songs like "What You Doing," um, eight days a week, those they, the songs seem to like have a thread. They sound like they were all kind of recorded. You know, of course they'd be in the same time period, but the Beatles change so much, even from album to album. There's always like at least some nuance. Those songs sound very, you know, I don't want to spoil the party. They really sound like they belong together from the same bunch of sessions in my mind. Am well, I I'll tell you. Crazy? You can tell me if I'm crazy. No, no, not at all, because, you know, when, when I started getting, because, of course, we finally get the original U.K. configurations in 87 when the, the compact discs come out. And it was a bit of an adjustment for me, particularly the Help album. That was a huge adjustment because, you know, the songs that turned out to be on the, the British, you know, the British uh, version – I, I just was shocked because it just sounded wrong. You know, it sounded like the wrong time period or something. Like, um, you know, uh, You Like Me Too Much, 
uh, you know, was originally on uh, the, really on the Help um, uh, album, and they put it on uh, Beatles Six in America. Uh, Dizzy Miss Lizzie, tell me what you see. I particularly thought like something like tell you tell me what you see. I'm like that was on the Help soundtrack. I mean, it just sounded it sounded wrong to me. I mean, I thought that's that's further on in their in their development. It just didn't sound like you know the other songs that we're so familiar with from Help, you know, that appear in the movie. I agree. We'll have to go more on that one later. But do you two know, well, when Bob Wilson pitters around the house in his big old shorts, drinking a soda, and he suddenly wants to know something Beatles, do you know what I do? What's that? Well, of course I read your informative books, but Warren, would you know who I turn to when I want to see something Beatles? Yes, I do. You go talk to lovely Rita. (laughs) Lovely Rita? And what magazine is she from? The Beatles magazine, of course. Beatles magazine is a publication with 370 million, yes, I said 370 million visitors in all their pages. It's read by thousands of fans around the world every day. Beatles news updated every day, 24 hours a day. Audio, video, photos, interviews, contests, additional material, and even more than the additional material. So follow Beatles Magazine, the most complete online coverage, 24 hours a day. And you know I'm going to say it, eight days a week. Oh, you can go to their website, their Facebook page. They're on the Twitter that the kids love so much. And if you have interest in Pinterest, you'll find Beatles Magazine there. And now I hand off to my cohort, graphic designer, old chum and buddy, Brown. Thank you, Bob. I would would like to ask about uh, the album that was put out in 1964. It was a double album called Story. Um. It, it disappeared for a while and was not for sale. <clears throat> Would you uh, explain about that, please? Yeah, it's it's a it's a very weird entry <laughs> in the in the the Beatles uh, story that it was. You know, again, I'm I'm sorry to keep saying this, but get out the cash register uh, sound. Um, it was, you know, I mean, it 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 was another product and um that that capital put out um it's not available today as you pointed out i i don't think um i think it's out of print i mean well they definitely didn't include i don't know if they even included it in the reissues you know when they finally came out with a box set of the american uh, reissues i don't know if that was even included but it was uh yeah it was a double album and it featured different interviews press conferences and kind of snippets of beatles songs um but it did amazingly well. I, you know, I'm just looking it up here on the charts. Um, you know, in 1965, it it reached number seven um, in the United States. So, you know, not bad for an album with little music. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's this sort of quirky. Uh, you know, part of the catalog and and sort of forgotten. You know, I'm glad you you brought it up because, you know, I think people do tend to forget about the existence of that album because it was so, you know, so different kind of a, a you know compilation of of different sound bites and so forth. But it is part of the American. Um, you know, catalog and and you know people have it. So uh, and it's also kind of a nice um, time capsule, you know, of when Beatlemania was just at its peak. You know, when I mean, you can really get a sense of it through that album. Okay, um, here I found something for you. Listen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did you hear that? No. <laughs> Yes, I heard that. <laughs> there, perfect. It's supposed to be a cash <laughs> I hear perfect. Yep, you can insert that at various points because that's you know, and I I hate to sound so so cynical, but but that's what it is, you know. <laughs> yes, it is. It's all about money, even these days. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, um, the Beatles' second album had a had nice cover art, and 
a load of cover songs on the album itself. Can you tell us about that one? I don't think it was uh, released in England. No, no, that was strictly an American album, and uh, it, uh, yeah, you know, and and I was glad you brought up, uh, you bring up the the cover, because it's, um, you know, I haven't been able to find out a whole lot about that that design. I know as a as a graphic designer, uh, I can see why you were attracted to that album cover, because it it is really um, distinctive. You know, I, I like the, uh, you know, it's kind of a clean layout. It's got some great photos. Um, I'm I'm kind of wondering with some of them, I couldn't tell if they were perhaps outtakes from Hard Day's Night. I'm, I'm not really sure. But, um, you know, and, and probably just from various photo shoots. But, uh, but here's the deal with, uh, you know, with that album that, you know, obviously, the massive popularity of Meet the Beatles, which came before that, uh, you know, and it became such a hit that Capitol thought, "Uh oh, you know, got to come up with a follow up as soon as possible. And so they, you know, went back to songs from um, EMI and and some of them, um, you know, come from, I mean, once again, like with all these these different albums, they come from different sources, uh, a lot from with the Beatles, like Roll Over Beethoven, uh, you really got a hold of me, money, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of covers. Uh, but they also gather some um, singles, um, like I'll Get You and, and She Loves You. Uh, that's on there. A couple of uh, cuts from the Long Tall Sally EP that I talked about earlier, Long Tall Sally and I Call Your Name. There are a couple of Hard Day's Night out to, uh, um, uh, out tracks. And, you know, it's just such a kind of, you know, mixture of all these different tracks from different sources. And it was essentially, you know, again, uh, you know, they, they needed to uh, come up with a, a follow-up as quickly as possible to, you know, get get at that teen market. Exactly. <clears throat> I um, really think they put a lot of thought in all their cover um, album, albums. Um, but uh, what about introducing the Beatles? I know that had an interesting older cover photo yep yeah that is uh interesting and I've, I've always found it kind of fascinating because it it looks so like you know I, i'm trying to think of how to describe it not primitive but um i don't know almost uh like i don't know I, i'm just trying to think of it it's it's not a slick looking cover that's what i'm looking that's what i'm thinking of it's it's not slick uh, it's, as you mentioned, an older picture. Uh, you can tell particularly by Ringo's hair. Um, it's uh, it's kind of short. Um, and, you know, I don't know if it was a matter of, you know, it's the song that, or excuse me, the photo that they could get that might be, you know, a little less expensive for them to use. I'm not sure. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's striking how different that is as opposed to the albums, you know, Please Please Me uh, and with the Beatles. I mean, those were, you know, those look professional, slick, you know, what what you would expect. And, uh, yeah, introducing the Beatles has, uh, and in fact, it's it's one of the most bootlegged albums. Uh, and, and bootlegged meaning, you know, designing fakes. Um, you know, that album has been, I, there's a whole website, and I can't think of the name of it now, dedicated to the, to spotting the fake introducing the Beatles uh, album covers, because they, you know, and, and uh, cause they, I guess it's been reproduced a bunch of times, and there are different ways you can tell, but, uh, but yeah, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's, as I said, just has such a do-it-yourself kind of aspect the whole cover, but uh, but interesting to see that they picked this this very you know early photo um, of the Beatles. But I guess it's called introducing the Beatles, so you know maybe that works on that level. Yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting too. So uh, good story, and thank you for that. Oh sure. And, and I'll hand it over to uh, the bulldog. <laughs> oh brother the uh as as we're on the show can you see your chat messages warren 
Uh, I could if I had my Facebook up. <laughs> it's like a secret mode of communication between moderators. We've been cut off. I wanted you guys to uh, warn so, so much about the graphic art and his questions. He just rifled through them there quicker than usual. I thought maybe you guys could, because you're both, you know, he knows the art and you know all about the covers. Could you guys discuss the, uh, both of you, the uh, Yesterday and Today album covers? Oh, yes. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is such a great story. I, I love the, this whole thing that, uh, you know, the the butcher cover, is, as it's known, Um you know, the Beatles, I think at this point, were, were looking to be a little edgier. And uh, the photographer they were working with, you know, was known for that. I mean, he was known for, you know, a more unusual photograph. I mean, they didn't want to just have a photo of them standing around, you know. So, um, I'm and I'm trying to remember if there was, and I think there's been debates about were they trying to make a statement uh, you know, what What did it mean, the pieces of meat? Were they, you know, other people said it was a common a comment on, they were uh, saying that Capitol was butchering their albums. I mean, it's <laughs> there been a lot of, <laughs> which is kind of cool. I mean, it, it, I kind of wish that were true. Uh, <laughs> that would be great commentary. <laughs> but, very, uh, very interesting cover, I, I think. It is. I mean, it, it's so edgy, um, particularly for that time, you know. Well, of course, they come, you know, the, the record company amazingly didn't see what the problem would be. Sent out the album to, um, you know, to record retailers, and they freaked. I mean, they said, you know, what is this? The You know, uh, the Beatles sitting around with a bunch of dolls some of them with their heads off and slabs of meat what is this you know i mean whatever it is you know it's creepy we don't like it so um the album uh was returned i mean many of them returned it to the record co- uh to em uh no capital excuse me and they said you know okay we'll uh issue a new cover and so you see the the other cover which is the beatles sitting around that trunk and they don't look too happy about it do they uh no they don't i was going to ask you how they came up with that uh photo uh uh the the trunk one yes yeah i think it was just sort of a last minute thing i think um you know they they just uh posed around um and i'm not sure if it was taken i i don't think so it was taken backstage or whatever but i think what it ha- what happened was oh boy we got to get a you know picture taken as soon as possible okay let's just you know get something to throw something together quickly okay here's you know this this is this is fine and uh and as i said you can tell by the expressions on their faces how much they wanted to be in that photo session <laughs> i mean yeah, it's right pretty obvious but of course it's not offensive and so you know it's sent back to the record stores they're you know much happier but as we all know um the uh the butcher cover if you have what's called a first state butcher cover meaning it's the way it was when it was first released because what capital did was they actually posted the trunk cover over some of the butcher covers and so uh, if you have one that nothing was pasted over it, the, the you know, the trunk picture was not post, uh, pasted over the butcher cover, it's worth a lot of money. Yes, it is. Mm, it yes, really it is. is. I, I have uh, a few of those in my collection. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I was, my next question was about the first date, second state, in third state, and you pretty much explained that. I appreciate that. Oh, sure. Yeah, now, um, and second state, you know, that's really tough because I'm sure many, many people have tried to steam off, you know, the the uh, trunk picture, um, and uh, in the process, of course, ruining <laughs> the butcher cover. It's hard to steam it off without doing any damage. I mean, it has been done. But uh, but because of that, they're not worth quite as much as a first state. Uh, somebody on Antiques Roadshow a few years ago brought in a first state one, and oh, I mean, you know, I could tell the appraiser 
you know, was was <laughs> jumping out of his skin, you know, <laughs> like like he couldn't <laughs> wait to tell her. Wow. Yes, um, <laughs> that's a very nice album to have in your collection, that's for sure. That's for sure. Absolutely. And if you have the butcher cover, even nicer. But but that's another one that you have to be careful. There are a lot of fakes out there. Yes, there is. Mm-hmm. Okay, Mr. Bulldog, your turn. Why, right, thank you, Sawar. You you had talked about Help before, and that was an interesting album. Um, I was talking to one of my friends once, and he pointed out to me I hadn't caught it. I just said, there's something different about those songs, and he talked about the way the background vocals came in and such on the American release. But um, George Martin uh, also had some songs on there. I guess he got a payday from maybe having written some of them. Tell Mm -hmm. us about those two releases and George Martin's hand going in there, coming up with some instrumentals. Yeah, I mean that that's a particularly fascinating album, you know, as I mentioned a bit earlier. Uh very different. I mean, that is is so different from the British version because and and as I mentioned earlier, this was the album I really had a hard time getting used to, you know, because it was such a different the UK one is such a different configuration. I mean, you know, again, I was I was refreshing my memory of the differences. I mean, you know, they're missing, the American version of Help is missing Act Naturally, It's Only Love, uh, You Like Me Too Much, Tell Me What You See, I've Just Seen a Face Yesterday, and, and Dizzy Miss Lizzie. I mean, they're they're missing a lot of, of tracks, but in place of those, as you just mentioned, uh, Bob, is are the instrumentals that uh, George came up with, and uh, George Martin, and, you know, I I thought those were interesting to have. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, sad that, you know, you can't really get those now unless you, of course, buy in, you know, the, the box set. Um, but it's, you know, cause I think they're valuable to have. I mean, I really, I, I've liked hearing the, um, you know, his re, the rearrangements of, of Beatles hits and in the, you know, Indian style and that sort of thing. And, uh, the James Bond sounding, uh, um, tracks and, you know, I mean, you hear a lot of really cool, um, you know, instrumentals and you really get a sense of, of what George Martin did. I mean, you know, what a great arranger, um, and, and composer he was. And so imagine, you know, going from that to then in 87, you're Wait a getting... minute, you said imagine, and right away the song went into my head. What yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I didn't mean to do that. That was, but, but you know. You that's... threw me totally off track, but that's not hard to do. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yep, and yep. Imagine comes later. But, uh, but yeah, with, with help, I mean, you know, I was just stunned when I bought the 87 you know the the British compilation, and you were hearing all those songs that I mentioned, and and they just sounded weird to me on Help. You know, I remember thinking, you know, really, I think of I've just seen a face on Rubber Soul, you know, um, and uh, and you know, Act Naturally was kind of sounded like an oddity. Yesterday, um, I mean, to me, I was so used to that original configuration that I I just really, uh, you know, this this was a hard one to adjust to. Well, you could, all, like you're alluding to, like if you took those tracks and, you know, through the magic of radio, you didn't know which album they came from for a few minutes, I bet you could pick most of it out, like which ones were recorded at the same time because the nuance between albums was so different. Like there right. really was a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and it's it's just so interesting when, you know, you listen to the, the I mean, you really hear it on the British version of Help, how they're going from, um, you know, from like the song Help, which is, I mean, it's it's great, but it's, you know, it's a, a bit poppy and all that. And you can hear them uh, then through Yesterday, I've Just Seen a Face, you know, uh, they're starting to move on to their next phase you know you can hear them growing as artists and and i will say on the american album the american help you don't hear that as much because of all the you know instrumentals that are are put in there but they're they're you know i think they're interesting in you know in themselves 
Uh, well, but, I actually yeah. listened to them as a kid. You know, usually you'd put on something instrumental and I'd jump the needle. But I actually played those. Sure, so did I. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I mean, they're they're really fun. And, and, like a you silent know. movie. As, well, as soon as there's no voices, I'm done. And that's as an adult. When I was a kid, it was like attention deficit times a million. But I actually <laughs> played those songs. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, that's 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 true. And, uh, and Silent movie. I'm, we have an artist here. I'm gone. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's a European film. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the other thing, too, is, I mean, it, it took a while to get used to, I mean, the American version of Help, it starts out with that, you know, what I call James Bond kind of sound, like that fanfare. Boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom, boom. That gets cut on the English release of that song. It's only it on is. the American record, right? Yeah. Yep. It's, yep. You don't hear that on the English version. So again, I, when I first got that that '87 version, I just thought, "Where's the? Where's that? You know, that introduction? What happened? You know, is it just was it? You know, I think it fit uh, kind of fit that album in a way. But uh, but yeah, you know. So unfortunately. Um, you know, the now official quotes, official UK versions. Yeah, they don't have that. It's it's kind of a shame. But but, uh, but yeah, those instrumentals, I, I agree. I used to listen to those too. You know, Sean Connery said in those days he only listened to the Beatles with earmuffs. But Sean's allowed to complain, so I have a gripe to bring up. Oh. You, you're, a, you're Dr. Kid O'Toole, right? Yes, Dr. indeed. Kid O'Toole. Like Dr. Winston O'Boogie. Because I've been having this tickle in my throat. No, I'm only kidding. But two things, two two things do bother me. One is like you know that Beatles story album. When I was a kid, on the back of the Beatles records, they would have like an ad on the bottom. Oh and right. It would be like f- five records, and you'd see like the thing to it, and they give you a little mock up of what it is. So I saw the Beatles story. It includes pictures. So I'm thinking, it's a double album. It's got a kick ass cover. Excuse my language. <laughs> And it, does. and it and it comes with pictures. I could hang these in my room, put them on my bulletin board. It could be like a designing Bob's room extravaganza. And I get the record, and I shook it, and nothing came out. And there yep. were no pictures. And it was a double album. And I just remember the guy who narrated it. I hated him after four minutes because I realized, one, there's no music. Two, this is banal. Uh, you know, that's another <laughs> SAT word for this one. And there's no there's no pictures in this. And I just remember him going, and the other three Beatles said, well, you're our leader, John. And at that point, I either wanted to break it off the wall like a Frisbee or sell it to one of my friends for more than I paid, telling them it's really good. That was a real <laughs> ripoff. That, they really had nerve setting that one out there, I think. Absolutely. The, oh, yeah. I mean, well, and again, you know, cash register noise, that's that's what it was about. And speaking of cash register noise, that would even pro- improve my second gripe which goes to the White Album. It's slightly off topic, but that's what I did. Sure. But it's like, on, I will not call the White Album the Beatles, and I'm tired of clarifying it. It's like all the people who listen to these shows, they'll pick on you for anything. It's the White yeah. Album. I don't care what they officially registered it as. I don't <laughs> care. They always have to make the distinction as if somehow this makes us intellectuals. Yeah. I eat meat. I eat potatoes. I watch television. I wear slippers. It is the White Album. That's what I'm sticking to. So you know right. what gets me with that one? I'm like a little kid buying the White Album, and you got the Beatles, you know, kind of disheveled inside on the pictures with their long hair and the beards and stuff. It's, you know, I'm used to them on the cover of something new looking like they just got scrubbed and, you know, nice haircuts and suits. So that's a big, you know, for a kid, you open that up, you jump backwards, you're shocked. Then you, like, pull a poster open, Paul's in the bathtub, John's sitting in a lotus position half naked. You're like, what happened to these guys from something new? But what really got me with that record is revolution number nine that takes up it's as big i think i'd rather listen to the beatles story twice than revolution number (laughs) nine once or cash (laughs) register noise because at least the bells could be could you explain to me like without having to be you know we were not tuned in we're not illuminated (laughs) what is that why does it take up a quarter of the white album well, I mean, you know, I actually did a presentation, um, uh, well, I guess it was last year, yeah, um, where I did a, it was sort of a top ten things to know about the White Album, and I I brought it up, and I, I 
yeah, I did this presentation at Beatles at the Ridge, and I said to everyone, all right, we are going to tackle Revolution 9. You know, we're going to do this. We're, we're going to get through this together. And so, I, you know, what it was was essentially John, and, and actually not just John, Paul was listening to him too, um, and he, it was a, um, a gentleman named um, uh, Karl Hein Stockhausen. Uh, and he was wait wait what was his name again? Carl Hein oh. Stockhausen. He Did was, he have a corporation with Klaus Wurman? Yeah right. There you go. <laughs> oh I don't no, think they got but, together. They have, a, they have a metal company. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. There you go. But he is considered sort of the the father of electronic music. But he would also produce what was called noise music, and this was part of you know, the scene that Yoko was involved in, the the art scene at the time, which was That's the culprit. Almost, uh, I'm sorry? I said there's the culprit in this. Yeah. I didn't think John, <laughs> I didn't think he went from love me do to whatever that is without yeah. some help from Yoko, but that's just, but, that's just but, my yeah, guess. But 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 she was part of, of this <laughs> she was part of this movement uh John, that we are was, going and, to make a quarter of the white album, it's all going to be noise. Okay, look. <laughs> Whatever you say. Yeah, but, She's but a I genius, mean, I, everybody. Yeah, oh, but I mean, she, she had, oh, absolutely had a, had a hand in it. But, um, but I mean, he, I think he knew of Carl Heinz Stockhausen before, uh, you know, before Yoko came along because he was. He I was didn't really, even know about him before this show, but he. Yep, yeah, it was. He, he could look him up uh, and, and hear some of his compositions. Once you hear them, you totally get how John put together Revolution 9, because it is so similar. I'm not saying John ripped him off or anything, but it's just, you know, kind of creating these these almost um, like audio collages, you know, putting together these different sounds. Now, you know, would I sit and listen to this for hours on end? No, <laughs> definitely not. Um, you know, but I think it was meant – to kind of, you know, confront you and and ask you and and this is and this is serious. You know, what is music? You know, and and this mo- art movement that Yoko was a part of was asking, you know, uh, about what is considered art. And uh and this was part of it is, you know, why can't a police siren be thought of as music as much as, you know, a guitar playing? You know, I mean something because like that. Because you can't dance to it, but it has a beat. Yeah, right. <laughs> True. I'd give it an eight. A beat. <laughs> That's true. But I'm telling you, if you look up his, I mean, the his singing nun up, hasn't covered Revolution Nine, has she? No, not that I'm aware of. I, I don't think she did. But that that'd be really interesting. <laughs> it is electronic music. It will go on for 45 minutes. You will listen to it. It is very good. Put on your earmuffs, Sean Connery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man, but but uh, but yeah. If you look it up and and listen to some of his stuff on YouTube, I I don't know if I'd recommend listening to it again for that long. But when you listen to it a little bit, you you get the idea and you really hear where John came up with that. I mean, it makes a little more sense when you listen to it because he was clearly as as Paul was listening to this uh, to Carl Heinz Stockhausen and and I think John thought. And Yoko, I'm sure, you know, we're like, let's try it ourselves. And uh, and as we all know, the other Beatles did not want him to put Revolution 9 on that album. And he, he insisted. Well, if I was George <laughs> crying about how many of my songs don't get on an album, and yep. that thing came on, I think I'd be ready to Pete Townsend my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're writing Can't Buy Me Love, you're writing Yesterday. It's hard to keep up with that. I kind of understand it. But yep. you guys are keeping me off the records with this, and she's sitting here in the studio in a bag. I'm pretty yeah. sure I'd go safely over to a corner and destroy my guitar yeah. and gently weep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what I'm saying. It's just kind of... But which of the which of the records that they released in both countries were kind of the same? Like the yeah. ones, like I, I think Let It Be was one. Yeah, actually, they were the same from Sergeant Pepper on. Um, after that, because I think if the, I, I'm sure the Beatles would have been livid 
if Capitol screwed around with Sergeant Pepper. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> cutting that up? Yeah. I mean, it would be, be a disaster. So they finally, after Sergeant Pepper, uh, that, the White Album, um, and uh, Magical Mystery Tour, Yellow Submarine, all those uh, are identical in, uh, in, both con- you know, in, in the U.S. and U.K. It was only through Revolver that, uh, that there were the differences. But, uh, yeah, they finally decided to work together with, uh, with Sgt. Pepper. But as I said, I can't imagine what, I mean, Paul would have hit the roof if he saw if Capitol was chopping up Sgt. Pepper. Well, did they make, would it have been different? Like, that's a great point, and that album is so contained, and it should be just what it is. How would it have been different if the Penny Lane and Strawberry Field singles had been included? That is, is that a real a, possibility? Yeah, that is such a good question. And I mean, they were originally going to be, but basically, and I'm I'm sorry to rega- go again with the cash register, but um, <laughs> the EMI, you know, approached them and said, "Where's your new product? Where's your new album?" And you know, they didn't have it done yet, so they're like, "Okay, we've done Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane, so okay, here's a single." And so, um, I mean, I, I'm. I'm simplifying it, but that's basically, you know, what it was. And so, you know, that's really the main reason why it wasn't on the album. But it's interesting, though, to think about, yeah, how that changes Search and Pepper, because we're so used to that, you know, that lineup of, of tracks and how they flow into one another. And to throw Search and Pepper, or, or excuse me, uh, Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane in there, um, yeah, that's, you know, that that changes it. Another SAT word. That was a succinct answer, and I now hand off to <laughs> Warren, Sir Warren Brown of the Beatles Kingdom. <laughs> Thank you, Bulldog. And um, there was another album, a uh, collection of oldies from England. Can you tell us about that one? Well, and, and before I do, I, I actually want to get your, your view on this, Warren, because I don't know about you, I love the cover. Correct. I do too. I mean, it just, you know, it really, it, it's just so, it's such great psychedelic kind of, uh, kind of art. I mean, it's still, you know, really eye catching. Correct. You yeah, know, and yeah, and I bet that it's, you know. I mean, from even, you know, from just a pure design, but uh, uh, perspective, that's a great cover. Um, As far as the album goes, and I, you know, sorry again, it's about money, but, um, you know, in the UK, it was only released in the UK, um, they, you know, this was after Revolver, and, you know, the group finally said, no, we're not going to have a new album ready for the Christmas season. You know, um, and so the record company, you know, got antsy about it, and thus put together, which was, you know, basically a greatest hits collection, which was a collection of Beatles oldies, and um, and it had, uh, it actually, so that I think the public didn't feel too cheated, you know, that they weren't rebuying too many tracks. Um, there were like Bad Boy was on there, and they, and that was previously unreleased that uh, that cover, um, and uh, you know, and then the rest of them, there were other songs on there that were just singles, and so this is the first time that they all appeared on one album together. Uh, now, of course, if you already had all those singles, you know, you wouldn't be thrilled with having to buy it again, but uh, but at least you'd you'd have them all in one place, and so. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, it was basically again about you know making you know selling albums at Christmas time for for gifts, but um, but it is notable for that that it really is their first greatest hits collection, and that it has for the first time uh, Bad Boy on it, which is a great one of my favorite covers they ever did. Right. I mean yeah, that a, that John vocal is just just incredible. Yes, it is. As is, as is all his uh, vocals. Oh, absolutely. And and Bad Boy is one of his, you know, I mean, just, again, to show what a great rock singer he was. I mean, you know, he, and, and to think that he hated his own voice. He he always mm-hmm. wanted it distorted and, you know, and change. I mean, I'll, I will never understand that. 
Uh, neither will I, because that's why I fell in love with George uh, from the beginning. I loved his voice. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and and it's uh, yeah, it's a shame that that John never really. I don't know why he never liked his voice. Well, I guess we're our own worst critics. Maybe that's it. <laughs> I don't like my voice either. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I don't always I like mine either. <laughs> I know you touched on this a little earlier, but were there any uh, releases exactly the same in both countries? Yeah, uh, yeah. Basically, as, as I said, from Sergeant Pepper on, um, you know, they finally uh, got uh, got it together, and um, you know, but before then. Um, it, it was very different in in many cases, as, as we've talked about. It's just amazing, as I said, how how Capital had the freedom to do that. I mean, you know, that apparently George Martin and Brian Epstein had no say over it, and um, and you know, and of course, in some cases, they were even remixed. Some of the songs were, were remixed. I mean, I remember, you know, some of the tracks from uh, maybe it was on the second album. I'm not sure. Um, you know, had more echo to them than yeah. the British versions did. And apparently the the label wanted to create kind of a live feel, and so they put more echo on it. I'm sure George Martin hit the ceiling when he heard that. I mean, I'm uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, cause, you know, without his consent, oh, boy. Yeah, I can just imagine. Yeah, okay. really. There are there are many box sets out there. Is there any of these you would recommend, and do they excel in stereo or mono? Well, you know, there are a couple of um, album uh, box sets of the American albums, and, and I should say here, I'm sure you guys know Bruce Spizer, um, you know, his, his terrific books. He was a real champion of the American albums and felt – and feels very strongly about how they should not be forgotten, you know, in, in Beatles history. And so um, they, he took part, I think it was in the, their two box sets. There was one that came out, I want to say 2004, I think it was. And I think he was very involved in that. I think he was a consultant and, and all. Um, but there's a second version that's come out since then and uh, from 2014. And I would say probably that's – if you really want the full experience of, like, exactly how the cover art appeared, exactly, um, you know, the exact layouts, um, you know, like, as you mentioned earlier, Warren, the Beatles' second album, you know, if you want it to exactly as it looked, uh, you probably want that um, box set. It's it's from 2014. I think it's just called the Beatles' cap. Beatles American Albums box set or or something like that. You can you know it's on Amazon. You can check it out. Um, that is probably the most complete kind of set. Um, as far as mono versus stereo, you know th- this is such a tough question because mm-hmm. you know mono I know is what George Martin said that he always felt was the true mix, and I think Jeff Emmerich said that too. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I grew up on stereo, <laughs> and and so, you know, for me, I guess I always respond more to stereo mixes, and they've gotten a lot better now, of course, at stereo mixes. I mean, some of the one, early ones they did on the Beatles, oh, my gosh, if you listen to them on headphones, <laughs> and, you know, you'd hear one voice coming from one speaker, another, you know, like everything was kind of separated, and it was, you know, mm-hmm. it just – really didn't work and of course now they you know with re- in remastering they can do a lot more um so you know my personal preference is stereo but i'm i'm stressing personal here because i know there are people out there who really feel strongly about you know listening to the you know first albums in in mono because that was you know as they intended um but you know, I I mean, I the stereo versions I I don't think particularly in these remasters sound bad. Um but uh, but as I said, I'm I'm sure people listening to this will be throwing virtual legs at me for saying I prefer stereo. <laughs> <laughs> but but I don't care, darn it. 
I like the mono versions myself. So, yeah, um, and that's you know this is just a, it's an ongoing debate, and and I totally see that side, absolutely, you know. But yeah, I grew up on uh, stereo. Yeah, it's a matter of personal preference there. So, yeah, I believe the box set you were talking about is the U.S. album. It's called yes, that's it. That's it. Yeah, it's yeah, it's uh, the box set. And as I said, what I like about it is that they really, you know, took pains to to exactly recreate all of the original album artwork, the layout, all that stuff. And uh, you know, that I think if if you're a diehard collector of the American versions, that's the one you want. That's awesome. Thank yeah. You. Oh, sure. And with that, I'm going to say, hey, bulldog, your turn. <laughs> Thank you so hard. I just was thinking, you know, like the albums they released, you know, that were compilations and all this different stuff. But mm-hmm. two of the ones that I really liked and I thought were really worth it. I'm milking this like you're opening the envelope at the Emmy, so you wonder who won. Yeah, but I'm I'm on I'm on my my toes in anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> like a ketchup commercial, it's like coming down at the burger. But yeah, right. I, I, the two. The two albums that uh, Ringo said he would like to see done, and then, you know, they were done. The Beatles at the BBC, can you tell us a little bit about those? I think those are gems myself. I think they're oh, under, my, oh, underplayed in, in different things. They, those, I I totally agree. I was so excited when that, for, and the second one's great too, but I remember vividly when that first compilation came out. Oh, was that exciting because, I mean, I had some crappy bootlegs, as I'm sure we all did, uh, of uh, of some of the BBC stuff. And, you know, the performances were just great. I mean, you know, there wasn't the screaming, you know. They were still really enjoying live performance. And, you know, and it gives you a little bit of a, an idea, particularly the covers that they play. Like, this is what they played, you know, in the cavern and in Hamburg. And, you know, so you get a little sense of, of what that was like. I, I just, it, they took way too long to to release uh, the BBC stuff. I, I just think, as you said, they're, they're gems. And, uh, you know, I mean, the best you could do before that, I think it was Beatles at the Beeb was uh, one of the big bootlegs you could get that was supposedly like the most complete. But, you know, as I said, the sound quality was okay, I mean, at, at best. But with the BBC compilation, oh, my gosh, I mean, you know, they, they the sound quality was great. I mean, they, you know, and I loved the first one, how they even included, like, you know, some stuff from the DJ and some little interviews he did. And, and I love that when the guys are reading aloud, like, you know, letters like, you know, this is, you know, Susie from – uh, you know, blah blah street, and you know, and, and wants to hear, and you know, it just it's great, it's great stuff. I mean, it's uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it's really, you know, again, it's it's a sense of you know, before they got so big, you know, that you couldn't hear them live anymore. Um, you know, this uh, these performances were were just, uh, you know, they just sound so intimate. You know, and uh, and they sound sound like they were enjoying themselves, um, and uh, so yeah, I was so glad when that finally came out because you know finally I could get yeah, put aside my my crappy bootlegs and uh, and <laughs> just uh, listen to the pure you know the pure versions of uh, of those yeah. tracks. And the other one that I thought wasn't, you know, I don't say waste of, if you have the songs already, that kind of, I mean, could be a waste of time because you have them, but none of the songs are a waste of time. But in the repackagings, I could see why people who don't have all the albums might want, you know, something like that. But the other one that I thought was cool, obviously, was um, Anthology. And although John couldn't possibly have been on it, I thought like Free is a Bird and Real Love, I thought those were pretty cool songs. And the other one I heard someone else, the third one that was going to be someone else covered what it would have been and tried to sound like the Beatles. And I like that too. Some people kind of turn their noses up at it, but for what it was in that time, I still like, I like those songs very much. Yeah. I mean, they were all, I, I remember so vividly the day after free as a bird 
premiered on uh, on anthology and you know the first night of of uh, the show and oh I remember I mean there was I, I mean, think it was, was I think it was, oh a what are you here Bob yeah nope I think I, Bob. Yep. Okay. I yeah. I, I didn't hear that one part. So I'm I'm sorry, Bob. What did you say? Uh, I just I just had a blip on my phone. We had like a glitch. I didn't say. Oh, anything. Okay. Yeah. Now I hear you. <laughs> but I was afraid you lost me completely, and I was nope, adrift nope. in the sea of time. Nope. Nope. I, I had a you. hole in my pocket, and I jumped back into it. And now here I am in the show. <laughs> <laughs> I like it's a good that. thing I wasn't fixing the hole because I couldn't have gotten back in. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> good references. I know. I love it. I love this. <laughs> oh my gosh! But yeah, I mean, I I you know remember the the first time you know the first night that uh you know and after the the first episode of Anthology aired and then they premiered the video of Freeze a Bird and premiered the song and the next day I remember driving somewhere and and the DJ was, was on the station. She said, "I never thought I'd get to say this." in my lifetime, but here's the new song by the Beatles, you know, and I mean, that's how exciting it was. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think people tend to, as you said, they tend to kind of put down those songs and everything, you know, they were, they were for a specific project. I mean, you know, it, I, I don't think, you know, I wouldn't equate them with some of their best work, but you know, it was meant to be, just you know the, just a, a special reunion and unfortunately it had to be you know more of a uh it had to be more technical because of uh you know of, of John not being there but you know I think Jeff Lynn made the best of dealing with the recordings that that he was given and and of his voice and you know but um you know but the songs themselves were great I mean it's too bad you know John never got to record them on his own it would have been interesting to hear what he would have done with them but um but yeah that was oh the anthology stuff and and the, all the comp the albums i mean the compilations i mean that was exciting stuff you know that was another mm-hmm. case of i had bootlegs of some of that stuff and terrible sound quality and you know but the funny part was i remember george martin giving an interview and saying he did not understand why fans wanted to hear outtakes and you know why why bother with that and everything and it's like because we're nerdy fans we want to, we want to hear everything <laughs> just well I mean it was such stuff. a pro- George George was a downer on that one kind of sometimes like he was you know he wouldn't do the third song and and like when they were doing Blue Moon of Kentucky I wanted to reach in the screen and like ping him with my pinky. The short version only. Like, can't you play this song? We've been waiting for 30 years. People, like, look for some happiness in their lives. You've been blessed <laughs> enough to give it, and you have to yell, short version. Like, Ringo, take the tambourine and crown him with it. Like, what is going on? <laughs> like, you guys are making, like, $90 million for this. Like, c- play a couple of Elvis songs and shut up, George. <laughs> like, that's my feeling. Maybe you feel differently, but you can tell me. Well, I I think you know it, it's it's just funny that you know at the time that that George Martin was just I don't know he just seemed you know befuddled that what would we want to hear all these these outtakes why would we you know want to hear and well yeah I mean of course we do this is you know this is history I love hearing how songs come to be and everything and I don't know I mean I I think on you know, God rest his soul. But uh, but sometimes when it came to like what may he walk in the netherworld endlessly without sleep forever. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't really wish that. It, no, just, of course. When people say rest his soul, I wonder what else they're doing. But yeah, right. <laughs> That's true. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, because I mean, you know, because hey, George. I mean, George Martin, you know, was was incredible. I I mean, the Beatles wouldn't have been the Beatles without him, in, in my opinion. But yeah, he didn't quite. I think understand what fans wanted, you know, and uh, well, he was never chased around the block by a mob of women, but yeah. like like the other four. But George too Harrison, the other one, like he, they were on the stage at his house and they were singing Blue Moon of Kentucky, and he's like short version. Oh, it's like, man. and then he wants to, and then he's like talking about. Remember my song, Dera Dune. It's like, 
Was that one of the ones? Now I sort of understand why, you know, the long John Lennon electronic music thing got on, because you wanted to put on Dara Dune. Not Guilty was pretty good. But play Blue Moon of Kentucky, for Christ's yeah. sake. I mean, yeah. can't you just sing the song? Can't you pull up, like they would say, that's all right, mama. Like, so play that's all right, mama. Sing it with Paul. Steal the spotlight. You have to pay him back for keeping his songs off the records for so many years. Just take the money and make us happy. That was my feeling about it. Be like yeah. Ringo. He's got the sticks. He's smiling. Go ahead, play all this money. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> George, I think George Harrison was was in a. Um, I'm trying to think of how to put this. Snit. Um He was. He was. You know, not in a great place at the time. I mean, you could sort of tell. I mean, he was. God, I hate to keep bringing up money, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think he was doing it partially for the money and at least and you know he was struggling well, they said with... he refused to do it right i don't mean to interrupt all the time just oh, this no. particular segment but he said you know like they said that they had a stock market crash in england and then he said no i won't do the documentary the stock market crash <laughs> hit and he said where are the cameras yeah <laughs> back to the regularly oh. scheduled commentary Yep, yep. Well, oh man, that's what, yeah. But but he, um, yeah. I mean, he just you know clearly was going through a period of you know a bit of bitterness. Let's let's just you know put it out there. And you know, and, and he had valid reasons for some of it. But yeah, I mean, there were times you know where you just thought like there was that scene where he, uh, George, and Paul and Ringo are sitting under the tree and. Paul's trying to talk to him, and and George is just playing, you know, his guitar and ignoring him, and you just think, you know, oh come on, it's you know, can't you know, work together here. <laughs> I mean, it's just well, a, everything Paul said, he was contradicting. Well, yeah. there were four of us, and we were at Shea Stadium. No, I don't think that's how it was. Yeah, I want to play my ukulele. Could somebody yeah. like give this guy a drink? <laughs> Oh man, yeah, George was definitely in in a place where, yeah, and again, I don't blame him entirely because you know he he was, you know, he, he did suffer disrespect from from John and Paul, particularly you know as time went on and he was just getting to be better and better um, as a as a songwriter and all, and uh, you know I I he didn't get the respect he deserved at the end, so I think he harbored bitterness over that and uh and i would yeah. say we suddenly picked up on signs of it but i mean if you're gonna do it and i mean everybody go i mean try working an eight-hour day george it's like yeah. go to work like the rest <laughs> of us i'll take being in the beatles the other two guys can sing and play the guitars if women are going to chase me i'm going to slow down and then <laughs> and, you know we could eat at the finest restaurants and like you know accountants pay for my bills I'll switch with you if you want to go out to the real world for a little while. Like, sing Don't Bother Me and shut up. That's just my feeling about it. Now we're going to have to go out and plunk down $120 for the box set where we get the short version of Blue Moon in Kentucky. Thank you very much. Krishna, Krishna. <laughs> wow. Warren Brown, you over to you. Over you to you, to Warren Brown. You've got some fun. Well, I, I waited about. for an anthology. I'm like, the, it's like the best we're going to get for a reunion. I see them sitting under a tree. I'm like, uh oh, he's contradicting the other guy. He's yep. trying to make the best of it. And then the next thing you know, he all but refuses to play everything but the ukulele. Then he keeps mm -hmm. doing a short version. No, I think there was six of us at Chase Stadium. Like, what are you talking about? How much money are you making for this? Could you be more obstinate? You're not the quiet beetle. You're the obstinate beetle. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I waited so long for that. Couldn't I have just played, like, if you don't want to do a beetle song, we could redo Let It Be, lads. I'm not redoing Let It Be. It was hard enough the first time. It's like, could you have worked this out before they started rolling the film? <laughs> Maybe you'd have come to a little agreement, you know what I'm saying? Oh. I think there's enough gravy on the meat here to, like, have you pluck that guitar, son. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That is so funny. <laughs> I waited so long for that show. I, and I he's doing short you. version. Yep, if I you can, say I short can... version and you had me hooked up to those electrodes like it's a therapist, you'd see the needles go flying through the air. Yeah, short version. <laughs> it was kind of like you were telling Paul... I'm not letting you sing Blue Moon of Kentucky, and they're not going to make this into a bootleg record. And then he sticks his tongue out. <laughs> just, 
had enough of that. <laughs> oh, man. Boy, I, I can tell you've just been wanting to get this out, you know. <laughs> I feel better, kid. I feel better. Feel I'm glad better you're my doctor. <laughs> I don't know if you I'm feel better, but I feel better. Oh, that's I'm so glad funny. you were a doctor and I could bring these things out to you on this show and Absolutely. we could work them out. There you my go. anthology well, therapy. I'm going to anthology therapy. I love it. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'm, I'm He so says glad. he's not guilty. He was very guilty. <laughs> Learning anthology. <laughs> Night two. That's what I say. Oh, man. But well, I hear I... you have a very hot book about another performer, and I think Warren Brown wants to ask you about that other book. Yes, you're going to have to excuse me, all you Beatle fans out there, but I want to know about the book on Michael Jackson. Absolutely. Well, it's, you know, it's a book that I, I, first of all, it was, it took a long time to write that because I cover his career from the Jackson 5 through his death, and and there was a lot, a lot to cover. Uh, yeah, I mean it it really it really was and I wanted to do a book that was just about the art, you know, his his art uh in terms, you know, his music, his performance, his dancing, you know, that kind of stuff. I really wanted to do a full guide uh to that and um, you know, hopefully, uh hopefully I've I've done it. I tried to uh also have a little fun with it by putting together uh, playlists like you know I was thinking about like okay if I were to introduce Michael Jackson to somebody who had never heard his music before what would I want him him or her to hear and so I you know put together these playlists and and I know you know people will be reading it and saying well why didn't she include you know XYZ well that's what I want you know I want this book to be you know like we we talk about the Beatles and we debate about different things you know that's what I wanted this book to do with Michael Jackson to you know spur discussion and and uh you know just really focus on on the important thing here things here which is you know his impact his legacy um and uh, and as I said is his art and it was uh it was, you know, big project, but you know, I'm I tried to be as as complete as I could, and I hope, uh, you know, I hope people will uh, read it and go back and and uh, you know, discover maybe some albums and and songs they may not have known about before. Right. Yeah, that's uh, a very complicated life he had, so I'm sure you had a hard time uh, writing your book on him. Um, yep. Yeah, I I talked, you know, when the publisher approached me about it and I said as long as I can focus on just the music. And they said that's that's all we want. And so it was uh, you know, so that's that's what I tackled and uh, and yeah, you know, it it was a case of uh the good news, it was like a good news bad news. The good news is there there weren't a lot of books out there about Michael Jackson's music. So that was great, you know, like, okay, that's great, don't have a lot of competition. The bad news was there aren't a lot of books about his music. <laughs> so I really had to, you know, do some, some digging and, and some research uh, to find out different uh, different things. And, uh, you know, so it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a challenge, but, uh, you know, but it was fun too. Right. I'm sure that was a, a lot of hard work and uh... – I wanted to ask, um, how did Paul come to work with Michael? You know, it's interesting. They met in, I think it was the mid-70s. And, um, you know, I think they just admired each other's work. And uh, and so Paul decided, you know, he wanted to write a song um, with Michael in mind. And, um, you know, so wrote Girlfriend. And uh, was going to offer it immediately to Michael, but then for, you know, unknown reasons, he decided, nah, I think I'll record this myself first. So he recorded it, which, of course, ended up on the Wings album, London Town, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, but Michael was still free to record it. And so when Michael was working on his Off the Wall album, which was um, 
you know, sort of his breakthrough uh, solo album, and he was working with Quincy Jones, you know, was producing it, and he said to Quincy, oh, uh, Paul McCartney, you know, wrote this song for me, and, and you know, maybe we should, uh, you know, give that a try. And it's very different. If you listen to the two songs back-to-back, um, they, they're, you know, they – really took two different approaches to uh, to the song but uh so that's the first time you know that they kind of worked together um after that of course the and Paul's told this story many times but uh Michael contacted him when he was starting work on Thriller and said uh you know you want to make some hits and uh, and so you know Paul was on board with that, and so that's when they, of course, first recorded The Girl's Mine, and then uh, then later recorded Say, 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 and The Man for the Pipes of Peace album of, of Paul's. And, you know, and I think particularly Say, 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 I think holds up very well. I think that's a fun song, and, uh, you know, their voices blended very well together, and, uh you know, and it was a big deal, if, if you guys remember at the time. I mean, you know, it was kind of like two, you know, huge talents, you know, Paul representing perhaps, you know, previous generation, Michael representing, you know, the the 70s, 80s generation. And to have them on one song, you know, was kind of, you know, it was a big deal. And uh, so, you know, so that's uh, – but that's how they started. It was really from um, – you know, meeting in the mid seventies. Right. Uh, good story. I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did Michael come to get the uh, uh, rights to all the Beatles songs? Oh boy, <laughs> this 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 could be a whole separate episode. <laughs> it's, it's really. It's, Sorry for that. <laughs> no, 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 because it's. I want to talk about it because. I can't tell you how many times when I've been at Beatle Fest or I've I've talked on, you know, other Beatles podcasts and they'll say Michael stole the songs. He didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't steal anything. Um, you know, it was a business decision. Um, you know, as as we know, I think we've all heard the story that when he and uh, Paul and and Michael were working together and particularly I think when they were doing the say 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 video, um you know, Paul was giving him advice and advised him to go into music publishing. And as we all know, Paul has a very, very successful music publishing business, has made a lot of money from it, and so advised Michael, you know, to get in it. And supposedly Michael said to him, well, I'm going to buy your song someday, and Paul thought he was joking. So in 1985, the catalog comes up for sale, and basically, and, and it's too long to get into on this episode, but essentially, you know, the deal that the Beatles uh, had back, you know, in the early 60s when they were first signed to uh, EMI, you know, a publishing company was formed, uh, Northern Songs, that, you know, was then, you know, owned the songs. But I think the the Beatles didn't understand, because, of course, you know, they're young, they they mm-hmm. you know they're they're hitting the big time. I mean they'll they'll do anything. Um, they didn't really own their songs. This publishing company did, and they had some. I think they did have small stakes in the company, but not you know they weren't major shareholders. So the catalog you know was being bought and sold, and they they really had no control over it. So in '85, the the previous owner of the catalog decided to put it up for sale. And Michael said, I want it, you know, because he knew how much it was worth. I mean, clearly this was going to be worth a lot of money. And here's where the story gets murky because there are a lot of stories about Paul, essentially like Paul approached Yoko and said, why don't we go in on it? And Yoko supposedly said to him, I think we can bargain them down. Now, if that's true – Come on, bargaining down the Beatles catalog? I mean, nobody's going to strike a deal <laughs> with that. I agree. Yeah, I mean, that's gold. I mean, that's that really is. So they were going back and forth about it. Meanwhile, Michael said, I'll pay whatever it is. You know, And supposedly, I mean, the story I, I, I've heard is that Michael's lawyer 
called Paul's and and uh, Yoko's representatives said, "Are you going to bid on the songs?" And they said no. So mm-hmm. Michael bought them, I think, for like forty six million, something like that. And of course, it turned out to be a very smart investment. I mean, he made a lot of money. And you know, as we know, he and Paul had a falling out over it, and and uh, mm-hmm. you know it. But that's the thing. Okay, you know, on a friendship level, maybe that wasn't the nicest thing for Michael to do, but it was business. And you know, he didn't he didn't steal the songs. Paul had an opportunity to buy them, and and for whatever reason, didn't. Mm, Paul's mistake. Mm. No kidding. Yeah, I think he regretted that. Uh, he put in to have the uh, to get the publishing rights back uh, a few years ago. <laughs> Has he gained any of that? You know, this is so mysterious, and I I wish I I had more of the story. But but essentially, after Michael died, um, the eventually the estate or or uh, Sony, I think it is actually, bought the songs from the estate. Uh, from uh, Michael's mm-hmm. estate, and so so Michael is no longer well. He might own a small share of the company, but he's definitely not the ma- You know, the estate is not the major shareholder anymore. So there, are a story, you know, appeared a couple of years ago that Paul is trying to, um, you know, buy the the songs. And boy, is this hush hush. Um, you know, I I. I looked it up recently to see if there was any update on it, and all that I could find was an article that said that that I think Paul had filed a lawsuit against Sony or something, and that they had reached a settlement and reached some agreement, and that's all they're saying. And I'm I'm very curious as to, you know, what does that mean? I mean, obviously a lot of money was involved, but yeah, what does that mean? Now does Paul own the catalog? I don't know. Um, it's it's very secretive, but hopefully you know the story will come out sometime. But but at this point, that's all I know. Um, it is this is such a long, complicated story. It's kind of, it's kind of a crazy story, but uh, you know it's all it's all again I, I have, again money. <laughs> yeah. Yep. There you go. There's the cash register. That's, you know, and that sounds terrible. I don't mean to sound so cynical and and everything, but, you know, but, but I mean, it's, it's, it's business and, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it works. I I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. With all that being said, I'm going to hand it back over to the bulldog. Hey, bulldog, your turn. Hello, Samar. At the end of each show, we have a tradition. we wondering if you would participate in it. Usually, Warren and the guests sing, and in the end, and then I sing Her Majesty. Oh, but sounds But before great. we do that, we, we mentioned the Michael Jackson book, and we mentioned the songs we were singing. Could you tell us the full titles of those again and where people can find them? You bet. Um, the uh, My Beatles book is called Songs We Were Singing, Guided Tours Through the Beatles' Lesser Known Tracks. And uh, you can get uh, that on Amazon. Um, just uh, you can look up my name, Kid O'Toole, um, or, of course, just type in can the title. And then look up your number, too. And you can look. Yeah, you know my name. <laughs> just look up. Look up the number. Look up the number. There you go. See, it all just comes back to the Beatles one way or another, right? And so, yeah. um, you know, so the, the that and then Michael Jackson FAQ, all that's left to know about the King of Pop. You can also find that on Amazon. Um, you can also find I write a, a monthly Beatles column for the site Something Else Reviews called Deep Beatles. And, uh, you know, you can find that at somethingelsereviews.com. I also write a soul column for uh, the site Blinded by Sound. Um, and, uh, of course you can find me on Facebook, my website, kiddotool.com. Um, you know, I'm, I'm everywhere. <laughs> that was really interesting when Warren talked to you about Michael Jackson though. And I just wonder what it took a guy like Paul to the, you know, come to the point where he wanted to have him killed. 
<laughs> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. I we know. Get a Michael no, it was, my, but, but, you know. We could no, have Michael, I mean, it, Michael is dead rumors. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and, you know. <laughs> Hello, it, Mal. It, crazy. Hello, it Mal. A, this is Paul. He's got to go. Okay. Yeah. He thinks he's a thriller. I need you to be a killer. Do you know what I mean? You won't have to pay your mortgage, mate. All right. Nice talking to you. Oh, man. He wants to own Beatles songs, does he? But on a, on a lighter note, let's send them off with a nice vibe. Can you guys sing for us, and in the end, and then I'll sing Her Majesty, or I'll try. All right. All right. Now that Michael wasn't, wasn't murdered by Paul. All right. <laughs> and, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Yay. Her Majesty's a pretty nice girl, but she doesn't have a lot to say. Her Majesty's a pretty nice girl, but she changes from day to day. I want to tell her that I love her a lot, but I have to get Michael Jackson killed. Someday I'm going to make her mine. Oh, yeah, someday I'm going to make her mine. <laughs> That's not how it goes.